we begin to develop responses to poverty based on what neighbors like Josephine are, were telling us, right? We had 300 volunteers from the neighborhood, from the community, people who use our services on a regular basis, but who, when given the opportunity, when simply asked, felt really compelled to give back, right? And to be involved in a larger way in a grassroots movement to change things. And so we had lots of focus groups and conversations, and we just listened a lot. Um, at City Square, we're very, very large on listening. Uh, if you want to know something about a problem, a challenge, or a subject, go to the people closest to the problem, the challenge, or the subject. So if I want to know about poverty and how to respond to it, I need to go talk to some people who are living in it. And I need to fashion my responses to poverty based on the intelligence I glean from people who live in it. We have this nasty habit of trying to impose solutions on people when we don't know anything about what they're facing. And sometimes that's a real paternalistic, charitable, one-down kind of thing that's intentionally benign, but it can feel rather cancerous to someone who receives that. But if, if we respect people just as our given, every person, as Landon was saying last night, that's going to craft and shape the way we respond to people who are dealing with poverty. And so the number one rule is, if you're going to be in a community that's like ours, you're going to have to learn to listen a lot more than you talk. And you're going to have to take what you glean from that listening experience and begin to apply it along with the people you're working with. So I think I just need to give you just kind of a little overview of what we do in Dallas. And then we're going to talk about Luke 7, which is really a kind of weird and surprising text, which is not uncharacteristic of a lot of texts in Luke's gospel. Um, let me just begin sort of chronologically. Uh, in 1990, four years before I got there, there were two physicians and a dentist who decided they were going to do a medical clinic in East Dallas. And so every Thursday night, they were the most faithful volunteers I've ever seen. Every Thursday night, come hail or high water, they were there in that clinic. And from 6 o'clock until 9 o'clock, these two doctors and this public health dentist saw everybody who was there, who, who came. Or they saw as many people as they could during that three-hour block. And about 4.30, every Thursday, the line <laughs> began to form and would go down the street and around the corner as people came to get mostly acute medical interventions. And in that clinic... The doctors saw everything from a whole lot of toenail fungus, especially among the street population, to colon cancer, diabetes, gallbladder problems, hypertension, congestive heart failure. They saw it all. Now, I call it our MASH medicine era because that's really what it was. If you think about it, any of you pre-med or nursing or whatever, um, if you think about it, it's one thing to have a clinic that focuses on acute care, but what do you do with a patient when you find out something serious or you find out something that's more chronic? Or what, what do you do at that point? And so the limitation of a volunteer clinic that's sort of three hours a week with the limitations of a MASH unit is that you don't know where to refer. And that referral problem began to really eat at us because we were discovering diseases that we couldn't really do anything about, which really was a frustrating kind of thing for everybody involved. And so we started talking in 1997. We started talking to the Baylor healthcare system. Based on what our neighbors were saying, we don't have access, and a lot of our neighbors were undocumented Hispanic folks who didn't have any health insurance. They worked hard. They didn't have any health care. And their, their health care venue of choice was the only one available to them, and that was the Baylor University Medical Center's emergency department, or Parkland, our public hospital's emergency department. And so we started conversations with Baylor, and we received a grant in 1998 from the Metis Foundation to do an experimental project. 
And we took the money we received from that grant, and we hired a, a, an RN, who's still with us, by the way. And we hired three community health workers, promotors, lay people from the neighborhood who could promote health out of our little clinic. And we went to work for three years, and we measured our outcomes very carefully. And at the end of that three-year period, we were able to report to the Baylor Healthcare System that we had lowered the utilization rates at their ER by 7% a year for three years, at least among our population, our patient population. The thing I didn't mention just then was Baylor provided out of their volunteers in medicine program doctors to our clinic. And so we went from having three hours a week to having 30 hours a week. And we were backed by a large hospital system. And so now we had at least a fledgling referral network. And, and there are lots of ways that people like you in the various professions could plug into such a, such a clinic. The clinic's still going. We have a brand new uh, uh, facility right at the gate of Fair Park, if you know anything about Dallas. It's in South Dallas on Grand Avenue between Malcolm X and Fair Park. And uh, that medical facility is still done in a partnership with Baylor. All of the doctors who work there, work there are Baylor physicians, and that's their assignment. I mean, that's their job. That's all the medicine they practice is in that clinic. And it's a medical home for about 2,500 families. And it's really, it, it's part of the Health Texas Provider Network uh, of clinics. Baylor has about 60 clinics in Dallas. I go to one. And uh, we're able to come into their evaluation scheme and so we're measured against Baylor metrics every, every six months. And we, we're always in the top three or four of those 60-something clinics in terms of quality of care. I tell my doctor who's not there that the clinic I go to is substandard by the, by the standards of inner city of Dallas. And he always appreciates that. Uh, so the healthcare situation is an example of how we listen to people with a problem, figured out a way to expand and extend that benefit, through partnerships and hopefully made things better in that part, at least, of inner city Dallas. The same thing happened uh, with our public interest law firm. We have four full-time attorneys whose job it is to work at City Square, and about 90% of what we do in, is in family law courts in Dallas County. And we fight hard, typically, for moms and kids. One of the, one of the things that traps people in poverty is family systems break down, the lack of child support, the lack of proper custody understandings, and, and all the rest that goes along with family law. And so since 1999, again, because people have said, we, we, have, we have voices in criminal courts. The public defender in Dallas County is about as good as any in Texas. But we don't have any voice in civil law courts. And so in addition to family law, we do simple probate, we do uh, some consumer law. We do some landlord uh, real estate law. And, and, and we, I tell you what, since 1999, I can count on two hands the number of cases we've lost. We have fierce attorneys who come well prepared. And it's interesting to watch the court system respond to a very low-income person who shows up with first-class representation. All the judges know our attorneys. And so when we walk into court, if we're representing you or your family, uh, you've, you're, you're going to be okay, typically. Very rarely uh, do we have a situation that's uh, involving a case that we lose. A lot of things are settled out of court. But we consider this to be one of the most important parts of our ministry because it's really relieving people of oppressive burdens financially as well as psychologically and spiritually. Um, so years ago, someone asked about, the, you know, where's the ministry and what we do, you know, and uh, I told them, and it's true, you know, we have a minister at the Central Dallas Church who refers people for employment training, and we have attorneys who pray with our clients, and so it's everywhere. I mean, the whole thing's about faith. Um, we also heard voices early on saying to us from the community, the housing in this part of town is substandard. And then other voices who were from among the homeless population, also our friends, 
who simply said, I had nowhere to stay. Here's what it's like to be in a shelter. Here are the limitations of transitional housing. Can you do anything to help us out, both in terms of workforce housing and in terms of housing for homeless people? And so we took that seriously, and we went to work trying to figure out uh, what to do about that. In about 2001, we formed a separate nonprofit organization, a community development corporation called Central Dallas CDC. And through that vehicle, we've done some of our housing development. Uh, we've owned a, a number of multifamily housing developments. Uh, we sold a number of those as well. We, uh, in 2004, built our first new multifamily development in East Dallas on one acre of land. High density, kind of new urban feel, uh, built to fit into the neighborhood. We realized at that point that in order to do housing in Dallas, especially subsidized housing for low-income people, you had to have already done housing. You had to have a track record, so it was kind of a chicken or the egg sort of thing. And we just pressed until we found this acre and we built 21 units of housing on that acre of land and we demonstrated we could actually build something and not go bankrupt in the process. It's interesting today, that first new development that we did has been master leased by Abilene Christian University. And we have students living there with us full, I mean, year round uh, for a year. And we love to entertain uh, some sort of relationship like that with Harding as well. It's really working well for us. These young people are attacking a lot of problems that our neighbors have identified, especially in public education. And, but they live there uh, on that property, along with some other kids who are part of a program called ScholarShot. And ScholarShot's mission in Dallas is to take local high school graduates and place them in our community college system and help them become successful. One of the things we've learned is if a person in Dallas County is going to community college, they need to leave home. Because typically the homes and the neighborhoods and the lives of the low income students is so noisy, so distracted, and so full of other obligations, they never can be successful in school. And so these scholarship kids are living alongside the ACU kids, which is really a great influence for both. And they're helping each other matriculate through higher education. Um, there was a meeting the other night of the scholarship uh, uh, prospective students, and it was really a dynamic conversation, and I got to sit in on part of it. Um, but our housing has led us down all kinds of different pathways. Uh, our Community Development Corporation has developed hundreds of units of affordable housing. The director uh, did an analysis of all of our housing uh, for me last week. We have 1,407 apartments in Dallas that we either have developed and managed or simply managed now under a contract. Uh, we have almost 500 units of that 1407 that are set aside for formerly homeless persons. Uh, we've developed some of those apartments, like the 15-story building we redid in downtown Dallas uh, in uh, 2000. We bought the building in 2006, and we opened it in 2010. It's a high-rise building, 15-story building, right across the street from the YMCA downtown near the Arts District, if you know downtown Dallas. And that building had been vacant for 20 years when we got it under contract. A kind of an amusing side of life. When we bought that building, the CDC and City Square had a combined total of 2,500 bucks in the bank. And we bought this building really on faith and the, the prospect of getting a tax credit award to renovate it, which we were able to do. And so now we have a 15-story building that has 200 apartments, 100 of which are set aside for formerly homeless persons, and 100 of which are means tested by the tax credit rules, which means practically if you make up to $30,000 a year, you can live in our building. If you make more than that, you can't. And so it's truly in a, a, the first in, in living memory affordable housing development in downtown Dallas, which is booming. If you know Dallas, the housing market downtown inside the the loop is just, it's just booming. So it's a great place to live because people can walk to work or they can find a great community in which to live if they're uh, disabled, as are many of our residents. So we have some housing like that, that that we've developed. And everywhere we have housing, we have a community life team, a neighbor support services team. I call it the concierge team. And they're there to work with the residents to help the residents achieve whatever the residents want to achieve. I'll say more about that in just a moment. 
We also have, uh, we're part of the continuum of care. Every city, every major city in America responding to President uh, George W. Bush's 10-year uh, plan to end homelessness has to have a homeless strategy and they have to have a continuum of care that's a community-based organization that draws down dollars from Washington, D.C. to provide housing at the local scene. So we're part of the continuum. And uh, we have 233 apartments that we lease in the private market. So we'll go to a landlord and we'll say, we'd like to lease 50 apartments. 50 is a really cool magic number. We, we'll, we'll lease as few as 25, but if you have 50, your community life team can really be efficient in working with the folks who live in the apartments. And these people are scattered in an apartment complex. So for example, one of our apartment complexes where we have 50 people, there's 450 units and 50 of them are our folks who were formerly homeless. Well, you, you can just imagine what it's like for a person who's been on the streets, who's been, whose health has been compromised, who's been chronically homeless, and who is disabled, finding a place that they can call home. Uh, there was a friend of mine uh, some years ago, as a matter of fact, uh, in 2008, uh, George W. Bush's uh, secretary of HUD was a guy named Steve Preston, great guy. He came to Dallas, or he came to Fort Worth to the HUD field office, and they told him to come over and talk to us. And so he, the secretary came over to tour one of our properties, and he met a guy named Leon. Leon had been homeless for 11 years, and uh, he, when, when the secretary walked into the apartment, he was overwhelmed by the fact that it was just immaculate. It was a great apartment. It was so well-managed, well-kept, uh, decorated flawlessly, and this is Leon's apartment, Leon's taste, and Leon's living there. He had a part-time job and walking distance, and so he's talking to the secretary, and he reaches in his pocket, I'll never forget, and he kind of just he pulls out a key, and he says, when I reach in my pocket and feel this key, he said, man, it's something beautiful. It's just something beautiful. And uh, he moved uh, Secretary Preston to tears that day. But really, that, that's kind of the story. We have a few bad eggs, a few knuckleheads, uh, but, but you have knuckleheads everywhere. You know, the knucklehead ratio to population is about the same for every socioeconomic group in North America. <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time that uh, you, can't, you cannot explain poverty in America given its scale by just saying people are lazy and sorry. There aren't that many lazy, sorry people on earth. And I've noticed that lazy and sorry as a characteristic is spread at the same depth across the entire socioeconomic continuum, right? So I've known some so sorry, lazy, poor folks, and I've known some sorry, lazy, rich folks. The circumstance is just different because of the cash involved, but the attitude is still the same. But almost all of our people are really glad to have uh, the places where, where they can, can live. Um, we, we really take seriously, again, the dignity of people as we work in these housing communities. We basically only have one rule. I mean, besides, if you can't pay, you can't stay. All of our housing developments, cash flow, because of one revenue source or another. Sometimes it's a housing voucher, sometimes it's a disability check, sometimes it's a concerned family, sometimes it's, it's another agency. But we, we collect rents on all these apartments because we have to. We can't, we can't, you can't beg that much, right? And so, but we only have one basic rule. You know, just apart from the general rules of a, of a lease agreement, but we have one rule for our neighbors who live in our apartments, and that is be a good neighbor. If you're troubled, if you're dealing with some difficulty or some addiction or some major stressor, Welcome to the human race. We're not going to kick you out because you fail or because you fall off a wagon you've developed for yourself. We're going to do everything we can to work with you as you move through that. And so we try to live by the golden rule. That's how I like to be treated with my maladies, right? Now, if you bring your issues into the common areas of the community, then we got a problem. So... You don't have to be perfect. You're, this is not transitional housing. We're not, we, we don't have a, an 18-step, 90-day plan for your life. We're here permanently. You're here permanently. We're going to provide wraparound services and options for you. We're going to do what you want to do with your life. We're going to help you achieve that. And if you fail, if you slip up, that's not going to be fatal for you. 
But we need your help too. Here's the reciprocity, right? So you got the apartment. We're here to support you in living there. Your contribution to this enterprise is to help us make it a great community. Now, early on, people don't believe that. And they either don't believe it because they've never been in permanent supportive housing before. It's always been transitional with some, you know, guillotine over their heads if they don't perform or some time, some arbitrary time factor. But once they realize, you know, these guys really meant it, the vast majority of people respond and become incredibly helpful to making the community better. And so the longer we're in, for example, we office, my offices are at 5 well, they were, we moved into the new center, but we have administrative offices at 511 North Ackard. And uh, so we're there every day, and the, the property has gotten more and more stable the, the longer we've gone. Um, that, that's an example of trying to respond to what, to what people ask for. The, the other uh, thing that people have said from the first day that I went to that food pantry in 1994, the very first day, and it happens every day, I hear this at least once a day, often many times a day, do you know where I can get a job? Can you help me get the skills I need to get a job? Where can I go to work? Can I work for you? Do you know where a job is? I mean, I, every single day, that's what people want. The vast majority of people want to be independent. They want to be productive. They want to make a contribution, and they want work. And they want work that will pay them enough to live. And that's really difficult. That's really, really difficult. Um, but we have a workforce training division that was developed because our people said, you know what, we need to work. And uh, this part of what we do is very, very challenging as well. Uh, we've developed a number of work training products. Uh, we do, you know, preparation for work. We do life skills. And, and the life skills project that we have underway is sort of built on the platform of all the Microsoft Suite products. So we use Microsoft products as kind of a hook to get people to come in and sit down with us and talk about what it means to really keep a job, land a job, be productive at work. And in the process, they're learning the Microsoft products. We also have uh, an agreement with a local um, uh, hotel, the Omni Hotel, which is the city's convention center hotel. And we have uh, hospitality training, a hospitality training track that's really great. We have a 13, 14 week construction trades training program. And we do that in a partnership with North Lake College and a big industrial training laboratory they built out there, about a $35 million facility. And our people learn every, they learn something about the basics of every part of construction systems. You know, framing, decks, rooftops, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, hazmat, you name it, we expose them to it with the certifications that come uh, for going through this program. 87% uh, of our graduates get work, and about 76% of them have maintained that work for six months. We're really excited about that program, and it's, become, it, it's going to be more and more a part uh, of what we do. I mentioned the new center. We're building, and we'll, matter of fact, on Thursday of this week, we will open what we call the Opportunity Center. Um, it's at the corner of Malcolm X Interstate 30. And it will focus on employment, employment training, and workforce development, and nutrition and health. So we're relocating our food distribution center. We distribute about 2 million pounds of groceries a year to low-income working families. We're moving that from the little postage stamp building we have over on Haskell into this new center. And it's going to be more like a mini Costco. That's how we're going to operate. It's going to be like a grocery store. So we open that on Thursday. In, in addition to that, we have uh, the, the nurse I mentioned a few moments ago we hired back in 1997. She's become our community health outreach coordinator, and so she's going to be doing all kinds of health care uh, fairs and forums and education events in this center. And our workforce uh, development program will be there as well. We also have three tenants, three major tenants. Uh, one is LIFT, Literacy Instruction for Texas, which will help people learn to speak English, uh, help people uh, get their GED, and help people read. And they're the, sort of the premier literacy group in Dallas. They're there. A workforce Solutions of Greater Dallas, which is the Texas Workforce Commission Employment Office. They've leased 10,000 square feet out of our new center. And so the employment office is right across the breezeway from our workforce training 
division, which is a really cool synergy. And then we landed a contract or a lease with a group out of the Bronx, Pro Scholars, and their whole role is to teach and train uh, low-income uh, young people about uh, software and hardware development and maintenance. And the youth who graduate uh, from the Pro Scholars program graduate with A-plus certification and they're able to go to work immediately, at least at the help desk level. So we're really excited about that partnership. Um, we'll also do case management out of that center and help people develop life plans, uh, work on uh, managing the money they do have, and, and work on other issues related to family and, and uh, other, other matters. A lot of things have already started happening in the center. Uh, two of our tenants are already in there working, and as I say, we'll, we'll join them on Thursday, and the Pro Scholars people will be there uh, by uh, the end of the year. Um, we also uh, have responded to a number of, of other challenges. Uh, we have a big AmeriCorps team. I don't know if you're familiar with AmeriCorps or not. Uh, sort of domestic Peace Corps, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, darling program, I guess you could say. Uh, we've been working with AmeriCorps for years. We have 80 full-time AmeriCorps members. In the summer, that number swells to about uh, 300. And these uh, typically young people work uh, to uh, deliver summer, summer meals to kids who are out of public schools. And Ed Easton, I can't believe you can still fit in that jacket, brother. I love it. NAIA All-American Ed Easton and his lovely wife, Teresa Easton. Glad you joined us. <laughs> right here for homecoming. Um, so we have a, 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 an aggressive AmeriCorps presence, and, and we have a contract with the Department of Agriculture in Texas to deliver summer lunches and after-school meals to kids who qualify. So this year, we'll serve about 1.3 million meals to Texas kids. Uh, we work in Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Waco, Fort Worth, Dallas, and we just opened an office in Denver, Colorado this summer, <coughs> doing that summer lunch endeavor. Um, half of those meals are served to kids who don't have program sites. Uh, they, they, they just live in apartment buildings, typically, with no programming. Half of the meals are delivered to boys and girls clubs, to schools, to churches, to places where there are programs. But half the meals go to kids who don't have any of that. And so what we've developed is a 90-minute day camp every day for nine weeks. And the psychology and the pattern of that is unbelievable. After about the third day, when our vans drive up with AmeriCorps members and food, the food guys get off and set the food up over to the side, and the kids are ready to go. Because what we do is we do recreation, we do uh, conversations and instruction about health and fitness, we talk to kids about the importance of staying in the school, and we just ask them how life's going. And so there's kind of this therapeutic, uh, physical, spiritual thing going on with a lot of exercise and activity. And the kids love it and develop really great relationships with our AmeriCorps members and other staff people uh, who go out on these trucks and work, uh, work with these young people. Um, I'll mention one more thing, and, and this has come to our attention as well through our interaction with neighbors. Uh, we have a whole division that works with young people who age out of foster care. So we work with Child Protective Services in a 19-county region in Northeast Texas. There are about eight to 900 kids a year who we contact. We have a one-stop shop in Dallas. We have an office in Tarrant County. And we just do our best to work with these very special young people. The typical young person who comes to us in this initiative has had eight or nine foster placements. When they're 18, they're, they're emancipated, quote unquote, and they're on their own. Most of them have no GED, no high school diploma. Most of them have no job. They have no life plan. They have no housing. 42% of these kids without intervention end up in jail or on the streets. And it's just the most tragic reality. Um, we lobbied the state of Texas to raise the cutoff age just automatically to 21. How much did you grow up between 18 and 21? That'd be the best money we could spend to invest in these kids just by letting them stay where they are, especially if it's a stable environment, and let them grow up a little bit. But that's, that hasn't happened yet, maybe it will happen. 
but we work with these young people in, in a fierce and ferocious way. Sometimes that involves our law firm, sometimes that involves our medical clinic, sometimes that involves our housing arm. And so I think we're uh, getting better and better at being synergistic. Ed Easton, who I was teasing a moment ago about his letter jacket, is our vice president of uh, health and housing. And so he, uh, he has a really easy job just managing all of our housing contracts and then uh, making sure our health clinics uh, rocking and rolling the way the neighborhood wants. And so uh, he didn't get to sleep a whole lot, but uh, he's doing a great job. Um, so that, that's City Square. And, and I tell you all that to tell you that none of that would, hap would have happened. None of what we have would, would, would have developed had it not been for the intervention of Josefina uh, Ortiz. Because we were going down the track of just typical charity, handing out groceries and feeling good about it and keeping the can of corn straight. But, but we, were, we had an attitude that was not real good, as I indicated last night. And, and when we stopped that and just started listening to people with the problem, all this other stuff just seemed to become very possible. And it was possible because we developed friendships in the midst of all that. So, that's probably more than you wanted to know. you have any questions about any of that? Is it fair to ask questions? You can, can people ask questions in here? <laughs> Anything? Any que yes, sir. How did the connections with that one Christian happen? And how would you foresee that happening at Harvard? Yeah. Uh, the ACU connection has been interesting. Uh, years ago, I mean, 2000 four, five, six, somewhere in there. Uh, I somehow convinced somebody, I think it was in the leadership office at ACU, that we needed to have a studies abroad in Dallas. And so for three or four years, second semester sophomores, I get this, second semester sophomores came to Dallas, matriculated 15 hours of college credit, and served a 20-hour internship with us. And I think the largest group we had one year was eight kids. Now, we were asking them to give up a lot because at that time, Sing Song was in February. And the whole rush process, I think, was in the second semester. So we were asking young people to give up that experience as sophomores. And, and that's how we started. And after about three years, that just kind of went away. And then... Uh, when Dr. Money became the chancellor out there and had more time to think about things other than running the university, he and Stephen Johnson, who's now the dean of the graduate school, we all knew each other, and, and, and John Seibert, and of course Charlie Seibert, John Seibert's our chief uh, operating officer. He had a, a relationship with these guys, and we just started talking about how to do something that would put the classroom, they would just empty the classroom onto the streets. That was Stephen Johnson's image. Let's turn it upside down. Let's, let's learn out in the world and let's come back to the academy and reflect on what we've learned. And it was really sort of an extension of this philosophy of listening. Let, let's go into the world for its transformation and then let's huddle to reflect on what we've learned. And so in the past year, we've probably had five to 600 ACU kids through our world. We have 13 who live with us this year. Matter of fact, I'm teaching American history this semester. That's a hoot. Uh, but then they're, they're great, great young people. And uh, they've developed strategies that are really beginning to make a difference in three public schools in South Dallas. Um, it was slowly and incrementally, and they've gotten more excited. And then, of course, they leased the second floor of our building, took over the entire second floor, and remodeled it for an urban learning center <laughs> classroom. And... Uh, all, all, all kinds of folks come in and out of that classroom from Abilene. Uh, the Marriage and Family Institute uh, is developing a presence in Dallas through that space. Uh, the, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole nutrition program, graduate school of nutrition. I'm not sure where it, where it falls in the university, but they're coming to Dallas and using that space. Um, we've, had, we've had young people develop products for us. We, uh, a couple of years ago, the capstone project for an IT class in the College of Business Administration developed a handheld app or an app for handheld devices that, that would allow us to 
accurately report the number of meals we serve to the Department of uh, Agriculture in Texas. The Department of Agriculture's way was tick sheets. So you'd, every time you handed out a meal, you made a mark. And then, of course, at the end of the day, you got this wash tub full of tick sheets, and someone's got to aggregate all that data to place the food order for the next day. Well, these sharp ACU kids developed an app for handheld device, and so every time we serve a meal, we just touch the screen, and it does two things. It records the meal being served, and it geomaps exactly where it was served. And so at the end of the day, all you got to do is just go open your computer, get, 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 get to the application, and uh, aggregate your data with the push of a button, and you know exactly how many meals you served, you know exactly where they were served, and you know what to order for the next day. Well, that's made efficiency, uh, efficiency gains in that process are just enormous. And also, the Department of Agriculture loves it because there's no chance for fraud because they know exactly where every one of their meals that they're, they're paying for is going. It's that kind of stuff ACU kids are doing. It's not just in Dallas, but it's taking a look at the world of Dallas and then bringing it back to the university and working on how to solve problems. We're purchasing property around our new center, and we've had a land planner look at what we're purchasing, and he said we're just like Detroit in this little pocket of Dallas. And so one of the solutions, at least in the intermediate range, is urban farming. And so we've had the School of Agriculture from ACU out to Dallas to talk about urban farming as possibly a new track of study and endeavor that they might enter into with us in Dallas. That would be great. I'll tell you about one last thing, and then I want to look at Luke 7 for a moment. We are currently building, this, this, this is really cool, I love this. We're currently building 50 single-family homes for 50 very special people. We know by name the 250 most expensive homeless persons to Dallas County. The people who use our public health hospital inpatient, outpatient most often. The people who consume most of our mental health services for this population. The people who consume most of the emergency transport and management systems dollars, so ambulances, fire department and the people who use the jail most frequently. The average cost to Dallas County, not counting the city or nonprofits, the average cost to Dallas County per person on that 250 person list is $40,000 a year. It costs $40,000 a year to keep these people on the streets. We're building 50 cottages in a gated community, 24 seven security, high-touch concierge services, psychiatric services, and good housing for way less than 15000 a year. And so that we've, we've broken ground on that. That's under construction. It's right across the street from the Opportunity Center. And so we know that the men and women who live there are going to want to come over to our place across the street and volunteer and help us out. It's going to be a cool thing, I think. It's the first example in Dallas of a strictly housing-first model and I told one guy on the corner the other day, we're not screening people out of this development, we're screening people in. So you gotta be chronically homeless, you have to be disabled, you have to have some mental health issue, typically related to alcohol or drugs, and you have to have a criminal background. I had one lady, I, I had one lady, I had one lady in a wheelchair tell me the other day, well, I guess uh, I need to go cr cr commit a crime. I, I, I don't do that. We, we come up with some other alternatives for you. But uh, so we're excited about that. Check back about this time next year, and Ed may lose what hair he has left, and I may not have any either. We, it may be an unmitigated disaster. But we're, we, we're, we're believing, based on national, national peer-reviewed research, that it's not going to be a disappointment at all. Because the reality is 87% of people who are on the streets of America today could stabilize largely on their own if they simply had a permanent place to live. It ought to be a constitutional amendment that every night shelter in North America has to use the word emergency in their title. Because shelters do not equal homes. A shelter is to housing what the ER is to rational health care. Shelter should be emergency. We've got a woman living in our building now who before she came to us lived in a night shelter in Dallas for 11 years. That's crazy. 
If I can't drive a nail in the wall and hang a picture, I'm not home. And so, if we just simply apply the golden rule to people who begin to mean a lot to us, things change. That, that's all I'm saying. So, Luke 7 has this wonderful, uh, wonderful exchange. I think I really understand John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist is... John the Baptist is locked up in prison. And it happens to be Herod's prison. And that's probably not a place you want to be locked up. And so in Luke 7, beginning at verse 18, the disciples of John reported all these things to him. Now all these things mean the teaching, the preaching, and the miracles. He just raised the son of a widow. And the disciples of John rushed to John who's in prison to tell him what's going on. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits. And he given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. Literally, what you have seen and what you have heard about what you have seen. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have good news brought to them. Now look at verse 23. Here's the mystery. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble, literally, on my account. Blessed is that person who is literally not scandalized by the nature of my ministry. Now, now that's interesting. I mean, how, how could anybody be scandalized or stumble or be tripped up by a guy who restores sight, restores the ability to walk, cleanses the lepers at his touch, restores hearing to the deaf, raises the dead? And in that, in that same significant catalog of activities of Jesus, at, at the same level, possibly the crescendo, a, a guy who preaches good news to the poor or brings good news to the poor? How could you be scandalized by that? Well, what is there to trip you up? Plenty. If your agenda is different. Plenty. If you don't think that's what religion and faith should really be concerned about. And Jesus is in a world like our world that wants to define value in a completely different way. I mean, to do what Jesus talks about doing here, that's a mess. You think about all the relationships and all the situations and all the dynamics and all the I mean, all the unpaid rent. And, I mean, just, just the, the, the murkiness and the, the grittiness and the stinkiness of life at that level. I mean, to just really engage the world with these outcomes and all the relational kinds of realities that would be involved in getting all this done and living in the aftermath of it. It wouldn't all be kumbaya, i got to tell you. Our churches stumble at Jesus. Think about it. I mean, how, how do we really like it when people with these problems show up? How, how do we do? Well, Jesus is saying, this is the only thing. This is not some marginal consideration. This is not some tangential frame for the kingdom of God. This is not some benevolent closet. This is my mission. I've come to touch lepers and violate the law of Moses, by the way, in the process. I've, I've come to restore sight to the blind. I've, I've come to bring good news to the poor. What's good news to the poor? You know what I find in Dallas? 
Good news to the poor is whatever meets the need that's pressing them down and hurting them at the moment that I talk to them. Is good news to the poor outlining the plan of salvation to some guy on the corner? No, it's not. Because you know what? That guy's already got that part. 90% of the homeless people and 99% of the people who are poor in Dallas County that I know will, will, will testify about Jesus the first time they see you. Because that's all they got. So they got Jesus. And Jesus is telling us, if we really get Him, we're going to be engaged in the pain of the world for the restoration of the world at this level, personally, in a dirty-handed sort of way. We're going to press ourselves into the grime and leprosy of this world, and we're going to bring good news to the poor. And good news to the poor is probably a bigger check. Good news to the poor, if they're hungry, might be a decent meal. Good news to the poor, in isolation, might be a friendship. Good news to the poor might be a community that would love me and accept me as I am. But we don't get into that deal very often. And we stumble at what Jesus did if we take it seriously. And I, I've kind of reached the startling conclusion. You take the salvation thing away, and do we really want Jesus? I mean, you know, do, do you know who he hung out with? Do, do you know who he criticized? Do you know what he was willing to do with folks who were injured? I mean, do you know where he showed up and with whom he showed up? I mean, do, how, this is a question for church leaders. How welcome would Jesus be at church tomorrow morning? if it weren't for the salvation thing. There's this sculptor in Toronto who sculpted this eight foot long park bench with the figure of a homeless guy wrapped in a blanket, his feet sticking out from under one end of the blanket. Have you seen this? And you can see the stigmata, you can see the the, the nail printed feet of this homeless Jesus, which is the title of the piece. This Google homeless Jesus. This Canadian artist is trying to put one of these pieces of artwork in every major city in North America. Because the identification of the homeless with Jesus is an accurate portrayal of the heart of the gospel. And I think he's very offensive <laughs> to our normal way of doing stuff. I mean, I told you a story last night about Shreveport. I mean, just, just go do this race thing in America the way you know Jesus would do it and see how far that gets you. Years ago, the early 80s, We've been working with some immigration issues in Central America. There are people coming to this country fleeing death squads, and we were working with these families. And we met a Unitarian physician named Kevin Murray. He was an epidemiologist, and he worked at Doctors Hospital. And he called me one day. We'd been partners on this immigration thing. He called me one day, and he said, Larry, I need to ask a favor. And I said, sure, what is it? And he said... I have all these men, this was like 1984, 85. He said, I have all these men, these patients of mine who are HIV positive. And they're from fundamentalist churches. And they have no spiritual help because their homosexuality has made them not acceptable to their churches and so there's nowhere for them to go. And he said, I have in particular one patient who's very ill and he needs a minister. Would you see him? And I said, sure, send him over. What are you going to do? You know, so he comes over. And he's a fourth year dental student at Baylor. 26, 27 years old. 
he looked like he was 55 or 60, emaciated and dying. And after a brief time of pleasantries, he, he looked at me and he said, Mr. James, I've come over here for one reason today. I've come over to see if you and I could become good enough friends for you to bury me. <laughs> and I said, well, we can sure work on that. And so we did. And I, you know, I happened to, I, I was, I guess you could, I, I don't know if fortunate is not the right word, I was honored to be with him when he passed away and find some beginning reconciliation in his family. But, but Kevin, the epidemiologist, and this young man kind of started a tidal wave of stuff in our church that really didn't go away completely, ever. We had many of Kevin's patients and others who came to our church because they found some peace there. There was one man <laughs> who was from West Texas. And he came to our church and he, he died among us. And he, for some reason, he chose to sit at the back on one side. Of, you, you know how, you're, our, our, how we are in our seating patterns. We sit at the same place every service. And back in the back on the right side were older people who were members of the church. And he, he chose to sit back there among them. And they got to know him and appreciate him, and they ministered to him, and they loved him. And he died. And his brother, who was an elder in the church in a small West Texas town, called me. And he said, we appreciate all your church has done for our brother. We want to come have a memorial service in your church. And I said, well, that'd be wonderful. And so we had, I'd never been to a Monday night funeral, but we had a Monday night funeral. And his, his brother, the elder, came, and a lot of his family came, and a lot of our church came, and the auditorium was almost full downstairs, and all his friends who were older came. And on the other side of the auditorium were all, all of his friends from Oak Lawn, the kind of the Dallas gay and lesbian community. And they came into our church, and it was interesting to watch these older church members just unconditionally embrace his friends. That caused you to stumble. That'll mess you up. The only thing that trumps law is Jesus Christ's human commitment and deep, enduring love. And that always blows law out of the water. And that's what got him killed. And so, blessed are you if you don't stumble at what I do, because here's what I do, <laughs> and here's what I'm going to keep doing, and here's what I call my church to do. It's one thing to be a Christian. It's quite another thing to be a follower of Jesus. It'll cost you. And now where I should have begun, you have amazing privilege as a student at Harding University, as you think about the rest of the world, you have unbelievable advantage and privilege. Don't squander your privilege. Take that life that only you can live and invest it in the transformation of life for other people. Don't squander your advantage. Because your advantage is great. And your advantage should not make you feel bad. Your advantage should motivate you to be a revolutionary for goodness, justice, and love. And the world will change. And interestingly enough, the world won't stumble at all. It'll pull up short and be amazed. And that's what this is really all about, I think. God bless.